Welcome to Screen Time, everybody. Gary Tangway, along with Drew Yano, where we talk about movies, streaming, and everything in between. And what we're going to talk about today is one of Drew Yano's favorite writers. And at, because, because Drew likes him, like if Drew likes something, I know it's good. So I was not aware of Scott Frank, really, until I started hanging out with Drew. And Drew was like, you got to look at Scott Frank's work. Just to give you an idea, Scott Frank's work, if you don't know, includes The Queen's Gambit, uh, Godless, which I loved, miniseries, and The Lookout, which is a film we'll talk about later on in the show. Uh, so this show is about Scott Frank, okay? I am DBM. Drew, what makes Scott Frank such a great writer and director? Uh, I mean, to me, first of all, he's, he's just a skilled writer. He knows what he's doing with the, you know, with whether it's, uh, you know, a film or uh, a series. But I, what I like is his, his characters are phenomenal. He creates great characters and he puts them in great situations. You know, you can't have one without the other because the situation creates the character and the character creates the situation. You know, character drives plot. So he's just very good at it. Now, like every other writer, he's had some clunkers. No question about it, but he's he's just very good in my opinion. And you know, I used to love the great William Golden Goldman, late great William Goldman, who you know, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid we talked about last time. Um, All the President's Men, The Princess Bride, my God, Marathon Man, right? right? So he was up there at the top of my list. But you know, now that he's gone, it's Scott Frank. So. Um, and you mentioned some things. I, I think we should go through his sort of his, you know, his history. Go ahead, go for it. And and you know, we we'll, we just talk about who he is, how he got there. Um, you know, I, I I I've always been interested in him, so I was always interested in all this stuff. But you know, he uh, he he actually went to film school, where he went to US, University of California, Santa Barbara, and studied film studies, and then got his master's at. The American Film Institute. And I think it was when he was in college, he got the idea for Little Man Take, which is a movie you might know. Uh, Jodie Foster directed it. Um, and he, it, I think he sold it in like 1984, right? This is, this is classic screenwriter history, right? He gets the idea in 91, he sells, he writes it, sells it in 84. And, you know, back then, and even in the 90s and, and the 2000s, it's probably true today, although it's a little more scattered. But if you wrote a really good screenplay, everybody in Hollywood knew about it and knew about you, right? They all wanted to meet you. They all wanted to ask you what your next thing was. Which happened to you. Yes. It did. No, I mean, I want people to know. You I mean, you were writing screenplays. You were, yes, absolutely. It, it did. And, you know, I'll say on a smaller scale, but yeah, I met with everybody in town. My, my writing partner and I met with everybody in town that did action movies at the time but anyway he he did this and it got him a job he got him hired at paramount and he wrote some films uh like i said there's some clunkers in there i think something called plain clothes which was a horrible movie um <laughs> but you know when you write a script like that and again it's all characters in little man tate it's it's brilliant it's a brilliant movie it's a little dated now but you know it's a brilliant movie and he, you get jobs out of that because people like you, because you can write. And so he got, you know, some really good writing jobs. He got Get Shorty, which is based on an Elmore Leonard novel, right? So you get a you get hired to write that. You don't that it's not on spec. It's not something you decide. <laughs> they decide they want you to write it. And you pitch your ideas and stuff. So he he wrote Get Shorty, which is terrific. It's uh, uh, people quote the lines from the movie all the time. And, yeah, you know, it's great. And from that, he got get out of me. sight. Look at me. Look at me. Look at yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. He he wrote out of sight. Another Elmore Leonard novel. Can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah. Out of sight. My favorite Jennifer Lopez movie. Yeah, no question. She is she and Clooney, without taking their clothes off, without touching each other. The, I mean, the heat, the body heat when they're in the restaurant, I mean, it just, they're fantastic. It is by far her best work. 
Uh, yeah. And you know what? She had great material to work with. Um, again, that's Frank. He, I think after that, he went on and he did, um, do you remember Minority Report? I do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah he wrote that with somebody else. And, and usually when you see the two names, it doesn't mean they work together. It means one did one draft, right. one did another draft. Well, he, he, polishes, he polishes up a lot of, I mean, he polishes up a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know, he got writing credit along with the other guy and, you know, I, I liked it. I liked Minority Report. I thought it had a bad ending and, you know, me, I have a book about ending. So, you know, I wasn't thrilled with the ending, but it was a good movie. It satisfied a lot of people. Cruise was good. Uh, based on a Philip Dick, you know, book, which is always, it was always been popular in, in Hollywood. Um, he even, I believe, you know, I, there were stories about this, that he did an uncredited writing for Saving Private Ryan, which is one of my favorites. Right. And, you know, I almost can see that. I never knew it um, at the time. because well, He, he was also, also part of like, as I look at his IMDb and I go, oh, wow, he did that like, you know, Logan, the Wolverine series. I mean, this yeah, is a guy, a, this is, I mean, arguably he is, I mean, you mentioned Goldman, but he is probably one of the top five screenwriters in Hollywood. I mean, this guy commands big money. Oh, there's no question. There's no question. And, and you, you mentioned Logan. He did two Superman, superhero movies, the Wolverine and Logan. Right. Logan, he got nominated for an Academy Award for best screenplay, best adapted screenplay. First time that's ever happened for a superhero movie, right? And people love that movie. And I have to say, sadly, I've never seen it. Uh, I've got to watch it because he's, it's, you know, Scott Frank. But I'm not a big fan of superhero movies, so I tend not to look for them. But um, he did that. He did The Wolverine. And again, those are, those are writing assignments. Or in his case, if you're that big, they, go, they come after you. They want uh, you. How about Marley and me? This is, we talk about actors and range. How about, <laughs> okay, he goes from writing Logan that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, The Lookout, which we're going to talk about with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Out of Sight, Get Shorty, Marley and Me about a dog and a couple. I mean, it's an Owen Wilson movie. You're crying at the end. I mean, when I look at Scott Frank, I'm like, this SOB can write anything. Uh, well, look, he's written science fiction, kind of, in Minority Report, superhero, you know, pure character film and little man tate crime in the lookout walk among the tombstones which is liam neeson film that i didn't love but i watched it and it was you know it, it was satisfying enough i mean you're right he can do that and that's not necessarily true in hollywood not not a lot of writers can do genre and skip to a different genre and, and Hollywood tends to put him in a box anyway. So, you know, I, I just think he's terrific. Um, again, I, I don't love everything. I, I didn't love all the choices in Minority Report, but he, he wrote it. He didn't direct it. So he didn't make all the choices. Um, I have a question, but let's talk about structure with him for a minute. And this is where um, Drew and I geek out with screenwriting. So please uh, humor us for a moment. I'm with gonna this, I'm gonna cut in later with that, but keep going. Yes. Okay. With with from my observation with the Scott Frank pieces of work that I've watched, and I really started watching and paying attention to his name after you said you brought him up. With everything I've seen from Queen's Gambit to God to Godless to The Lookout uh, to Out of Sight uh, to all the ones that you just mentioned, I've never seen a loose end. No, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Do loose there end. are no loose ends. There are no gimmies. He ties everything up screenwriting, screenwriting wise. Technically, he's pretty damn close to perfect without losing the emotional flow. Yeah, I was a little worried when you said structure because, you know, screenwriting forever has been about three acts, right? Right. Story told in three acts. And, and it's not formulaic, but, you know, you can break down most films, conventional films into three acts. And it's interesting because of what we're doing here. We're talking about movies and in, in, in everything in between, right? Streaming, right. Streaming and everything in between. Streaming's changed all that. You don't need structure anymore because you could do right. long form. And it can be as long as seven episodes, like right. I think it was a Godless seven episode I, episodes, I think. I have to check it or something like that, seven or eight. And, and same thing with Queen's Gambit. So, 
you know, you don't have to go through the old screenwriting torturous way. Boy, I got to fit this story into two hours, you know, which is 120 pages roughly. You don't have to do that anymore. And I think it gives guys like Scott Frank room. Oh, yeah. Stuff. Well, he never leaves it. When I say structure to me, it's, you know, generally at the beginning of a story, there's a question, right? Then in a series, where, where, and to me, the per and you and I have discussed this, the perfect series is one season, eight episodes, which is what he does. That's what he does. He does Godless. He does Queen's Gambit. He doesn't do a second season. He doesn't, you know, he, he keeps the quality high. But to me, it's like there's a question answered. There's a question asked. There's a question answered. And there's also a lot of sub questions and sub answers. But everything is answered in the end to our satisfaction. Which, as you know, in screenwriting, it's really hard to do. It's a, I mean, it's a bitch, man. I mean, it's hard, you know, and, and I think people think that it's easy and you just write down and say, no, it's really hard to answer every question and make it legitimate so it's believable. It takes immense talent and it takes many hours of work. And this guy does it and has it. It's even harder in a streaming series. Sure. There's so there's many more, more characters and so many more storylines. And like you mentioned, in Godless, he just, every subplot, I'll call him, gets resolved. And, you know, that's a skill. And it, it, what it does is it, it's seamless for the audience, right? Because you're just watching and you only know when there's what we call a loose end, right? You only know when there's, because you, you think, wait, what happened to that? If you don't think that, They've done their job, right. and he, he did it in Godless. I thought, which was I, a pretty hard thing to do. I, I wasn't sure at first when I started watching. But this is really interesting. I like the premise. You know, it's it's a town run by women for the most part. There's some men there now, but all the men are dead. They died in a mining accident. That's a great premise, but that's not the whole thing. It all gets, you know, you know, you have your catalyst. The the outlaw shows up wounded with a bag of cash. And suddenly shit starts to happen. And so from that, all these other things happen. And he created this. This isn't some, this wasn't a book. This is something he created. And I admire that. I think I wouldn't know the first thing about writing a series right now because I was in a very tight thing. I wrote three X screenplays for the most part, um, maybe branched off a little, you know, and did something a little out there once but he that's a hard thing to do and i admire the people who can do it because how many how many shows have you watched <laughs> you know whether netflix wherever it is and at the end you're like nah you know i didn't really like it they didn't do this i thought they were going to do that i think what makes godless and queen's gambit so appealing to people is that it wraps up really nicely you know, well, you'll leave I, yeah, let's, well, well, let's talk about Godless in for a minute. And, and I think that it's one of his underrated series. I don't think it got the attention that Queen's Gambit did. Um, but Godless is about uh, Jack O'Connell plays Roy Good, yeah. who's a, an outlaw that wants to change his stripes. So he gives him yes. the name Good, right? Yeah. And Michelle Dockery is in it, who I love. I mean, she was in... Um, She's Downton Abbey. She's the oldest daughter in Downton yeah, Abbey. Yeah, I mean, Downton Abbey, but also I loved her in... Why she's so good in it, because she's got... She, you, you believe her as a woman of the West. Right, and Defending Jacob she was in on Apple TV, which I thought yeah. she was fantastic in. With Evan's Chris, wife in that. Chris, uh, that cast. We got to talk about that series sometime, because I thought Evans in that cast was nails. But also, you know, Jeff Daniels plays Frank Griffith. Griffith. He's the bad guy in yeah. the movie. And Daniels is also in uh, The Lookout. Yep. But so Godless has a bad guy that wants to turn good and the bad guy is chasing him because he's got the money. And right. the writing is so damn good that I, for Jeff Daniels, and Jeff Daniels is such a great actor, I had to look up the guy's name who played the main character again. All I remembered was Jeff Daniels. Yeah. I mean, Jeff Daniels is a bad guy, just steals the damn series. And there's there's two points. I want to I bring up to me two points where... They could have lost me. The one point where Daniels turns to the camera and, and he says, we're going to have a hanging. And I went, man, that could have gone way over the top and that could have gone wrong. Yeah. The other part is when he rides the horse into the church. Yeah. And I'm like, uh-oh, this is either going to go great or this is going to really go bad. 
and they pull it off. And after he rode the horse in the church and he speaks to the congregation, Jeff Daniels does, think about that. He rides a horse into a church and they made it work. I mean, he goes up to the pulpit on the horse. And when the guy rode out of the church, I was like, I'm in. I'm all in. That's amazing to me that he pulled that off. Yeah, I mean, just think of the character. The, like the sheriff with the glasses <laughs> just kills me. It's such a great thing. It, it made me look up to see, could they possibly have worn glasses back then? And it's like, yeah, they did. Of course they did. Um, and I, I love when he recreates the scene of when he shoots like multiple bad guys, including blowing the arm off of you know, Frank, which is the right. Jeff Daniels character. That's a great scene with the sheriff. Because it's a good way to give us the exposition and backstory that we need for this guy. And suddenly we realize, yeah, this guy with the gun, with the money, who's laid up at Alice's house, you know, that's Michelle Dockery, he's pretty skilled. Oh, so yeah. we're thinking he can do stuff. And again, you know, it's beautiful. Well done. Very well done. Um, the other thing I also like about it, and this is to your point, where a seven series, it's seven episodes. And that seems to be the magic number, seven or eight. Single season, that's it, get out, wrap it up with a bow, move on. He is able to give the background of the bad guy. Again, Frank, played by Jeff Daniels, when you understand why he is the way he is and why this, I mean, you never get exposition on the villain. Why is the villain the way he is? You never yeah. get that, and he gives it to you. Yeah, yeah, no, I you know, he's the father figure to the to, to Roy. Yeah. You know, and then we learn about Roy's actual father. It, that's the kind of stuff that Scott Frank does that we all, people eat up. They don't think about it, but they eat it up like candy. He never, yeah. yeah he, I, now, okay. So Godless People, if you haven't seen it, and I think a lot of people haven't, it's a must watch. Queen's Gambit, everybody saw. Okay. Now, I, I was going to say, what I love about this show is, and, and it's different now than it used to be because, you know, you'd go out to dinner with friends, right? You, know, you, your wife, another couple, and you'd say, hey, did you seen this movie yet? You know, because there would always be, what's the box right. office and who's the, what's the movie? And you'd, you'd ask, oh, did you see Goodwill Hunting or whatever the hell right. it was, right? Now you go out, you say, somewhere, probably around the time the drinks arrive, you say, hey, what are you watching, right? <laughs> That's what everybody does. And it's mostly streaming. Oh, totally, right. totally, it's sure. Not movies anymore, which is yeah. why the shows. I kind of like the premises. Why I wanted to do this because, in another thing, Scott Frank is perfect for this because he wrote all those movies. Probably could write another one. I don't know if he will, but he just seamlessly transitioned to streaming, flexed his muscles, and came out with Godless, and then Queen's Gambit. And go ahead with the queen's gambit well i mean queen's gambit which it, it this sets up the <laughs> there's a lot of themes here united states versus russia mm -hmm. uh you know female power you have this female child prodigy who is growing up in an orphanage in a nunnery bill camp who is amazing what a great actor what Talk a about phenomenal actor. actor bill camp is great um and he plays the janitor that teaches her how to play chess yes. the prodigy and she goes on to be the greatest chess player in the world. And she has to take on the Soviet Union, their greatest chess player. And what I loved about this is they he didn't make the Soviet Union, the, the Soviet Union chess player, he didn't make him like a bad guy. He no. just made him a great chess player. And even the male chess players respect her. You know, I didn't see, like they respect her. I didn't see, I don't remember a whole lot of sexism there. I remember her own demon. In the beginning there was. In, in the, the beginning. beginning with the yeah, high you're school. right. In the beginning, but when they got to the final battle between her and the great player from the Soviet Union, there was mutual respect. I thought, like he, he respected what she did, which I, I thought was a good take because it wasn't the simple old guy with the sickle and red flag, you know, coming in as the, you know, he respected her with what she did. She had to prove herself. Um, I heard that he sat on this story for years. I mean, well, years. it's based on a novel by a guy named Walter Tevis. And he co-produced it with a guy named, I think it's Adam Scott, who had owned the right to the novel. And, and Tevis had written a couple other novels, two or three that were made into movies, The Color of Money, Hustler. I mean, he wrote 
you know, novels that got made. So he, he, and then Queen's Gambit, they wanted to make it a movie at first, by the way. And I'm glad they didn't because they would have had to squeeze it in to two hours. It wouldn't have right. been as satisfying. But I don't know that he sat on it as much as he wanted to make it into a movie and suddenly streaming comes along because the guy owned the rights. Scott owned the rights for a while. And suddenly mm -hmm. streaming comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, we can do this. And thank God, because I think it satisfied everybody. It was, and it was during COVID too, by the way. Remember, it was during COVID. So we're all home anyway. Yeah, we're perfect. locked in our houses and we're looking for, give me something to watch. And it was great. And he always circles back. He always brings something back. He did it in The Lookout, which I watched last night. He always circles back from something in the beginning. He plants a seed in the beginning or two that works at the end. It's not forced and it flows seamlessly. And this is when her friend from the orphanage comes back to help her. It's like, oh my That's God. Brilliant. It was br like when yeah. she came back, I was like, oh my God, this was the little girl. They were in the orphanage together where she became, <laughs> sorry for became uh, the drugs. Uh, the drugs. She became addicted to drugs because they get into the drugs in the orphanage, right? Because they wanted to medicate the kids and she becomes addicted and she becomes an alcoholic and a drug addict. And her friend from the orphanage, like 20 years later, whatever, comes back to rescue her. And I went, oh my God. Gives her the money. Gives her the money to go to Russia. Yeah. I mean, I totally, I totally forgot about her. This is an awesome, awesome job of writing. He did it in Minority Report too. Little stuff planted in the beginning. He's good. Um, we should talk about before we wrap up the the lookout. Yeah, because go ahead. I, I recommend this to people all the time because it took me by surprise. And I watched it because it was him. And it was, I think, the first thing he directed. And it was so unexpected to me how good it was. Now I know you don't feel the same way, you said. I think I know why, though. And I think I know why it didn't do as well as you think it should have. But go ahead. You know, he had this one floating around for a while. It didn't get made till 2007. Um, got some big names attached or or almost attached to direct it. Sam Mendes, who, who did American Beauty and then did sure. Road to Perdition instead of this. Um, who else did he have? He, I think he wanted, uh, the he, he wanted somebody else, but he ended up doing it. And I, brief story, I, I used to be a panelist at the Austin Film Festival, which is a big screenwriting conference. And I, I was on a panel with uh, John Lee Hancock, who's a really good director and writer. He did- uh, he did The Rookie. He did The Rookie. He did- uh, what else did he do? He's done so many things. He did at the Alamo. He wow. did the blind side. He did the Walt Disney one. Anyway, we were talking, you know, before the thing started and he, he said, what are you saying? And I said, oh, I love Scott Frank. I love the lookout. He goes, oh, Scott's one of my best friends. We have office next to each other and whatever the studio was. And he said, he kept trying to get me to direct it. And I kept saying to him, no, you've got to direct this. You have to direct it. And of course he did. So it's, you know, but he kept trying to pawn, pawn it off. I don't, it's like he didn't want to direct it, but I thought he did a great job. Now you tell me what you didn't like about it. The one thing is, it, and I wish I felt differently. It's just how I honestly feel. The main character played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, to give people a background, he comes from a very wealthy family. He's a star hockey player. And due to careless, reckless driving, he gets in a car accident, kills two of his friends, uh, maims one of his his girlfriend at the time who loses a leg, leg and he loses his hockey career and his ability he, 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 it's amazing he's alive he's a lot he's lost a lot of his uh, he had a head injury and head he, injury and he, lost, he has loses no, he has a lot of cognitive injury. functions right and and he, he and keep he's a more, notebook right and he has a notebook kind of like memento to yeah. kind of remember remember things and he and he's living with jeff daniels so there's a couple of things so he's kind of he's away from the family he feels a lot of guilt because of what he's done He's living with Jeff Daniels, who is sightless. Uh, and I don't really get why he's living with Jeff Daniels. Maybe I missed it. I think it's part of his rehab process. Um, yeah. It's part of his rehab process. So uh, Jeff Daniels is there is kind of to mentor him back into mainstream life. And Jeff lost his sight. His character lost his sight in a meth accident, which mm. he explains. And so his job is he cleans a bank at night. 
Yeah. They didn't have the small bets. Let's not give away too much. Oh, too much because you want to see it. Like. But it, but anyways, so that's it. Um, at the end of the day, he still, I, I, I was still angry with him. I wasn't by the end of the by the end of the movie. I was not rooting for the character enough. By the end of the movie, I and it's it's unusual with a Scott Frank, you know, with a Scott Frank film. By the end, you're like, okay, there's been redemption. I'm rooting for her. I'm rooting for him. And by the end, I was still like, see, I thought he did something really good at the end. Used his skills, and uh, you know. Well, he well, won the typical day. Frank script that. where he tied everything up perfectly. Yeah. I mean, everything that happened, all the seeds that were planted at the beginning and you didn't know whether they were seeds, by the end, Frank paid them off perfectly. It, it's, it's, you, you could teach this. It's such a great screenplay. Oh, it's, I, I, I would tell people it's great because you got both our, our, our thoughts on this. I love it. I, I constantly tell people, hey, have you ever seen The Lookout? Oh, you got to watch The Lookout. You're going to like it. You're not going to waste your time. Did you feel like you wasted your time? Oh, my God, no. And I think from a screenplay perspective, if I read it, I would think that this is a screenplay like Jerry Maguire, like you and I talk about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all on the page. You know, you read a Cameron Crowe script, Jerry Maguire, like this is one of the greatest, greatest screenplays ever. And I could see if I had read The Lookout, I would feel the same way. Because technically and emotionally, I think it's perfect. The acting just didn't pay it off for me, which I'm a huge Joseph Gordon-Levitt fan. And Jeff Daniels was fantastic, but there was just something at the end where I wasn't completely fulfilled with the redemption of the main character. That's it. That's all I got for it. Well, I, I, I would love for anybody who listens to us to try it out. I think part of the reason for that is the kid's disability doesn't get changed. It can't change. Right. He is who he is. He's got memory deficit and it's probably not going to get resolved, but he overcomes it. That's what I liked. And, you know, he, he, he no longer was going to be deceived because deceit is a big part of it. Right. Right. So, now, and, and Matthew Good is the villain, by the way. And we talked yeah. about Matthew Good when we did the offer and you will almost not recognize him. I didn't know he's, who he was. He's a villain no. and he's I fantastic. I swear to God, Matthew Good has to be the greatest actor working today. Nobody knows about yeah, because you told me Matthew Good was in this movie, and he plays Gary Spargo, who is the villain, the bad guy, I, the bad guy. And I went, no clue. And at the end, I was like, who, where was Matthew Good? Where was Matthew Good? And I looked, and I went, get out, yeah. get out. Mm -hmm. I had no. I mean, if you watch the offer and you watch this, Matthew Good, you cannot tell no. that they're the same guy. That's an actor. You can't do it. That's an actor right there. Oh my God. I mean, I believe was, it before this, he was in a Woody Allen film, I think. I think oh my God. Tennis player in a Woody Allen film. I can't remember, but that's where I first saw him. I don't know if it was before this or after, but anyway, so listen, I, you know, instead of going too far back into, you know, here's something you should pull out and show your kids. I thought given it's Scott Frank, let's use a Scott Frank one. Little Man Tate, I could have done that. Right. I think Little Man Tate's a little uh, dated. It's interesting. You'll like it. You'll see why it was good at the time. Um, but um, I, I, I thought if we're going to recommend somebody go back and look at an older movie, uh, let's, let's try to look out. Anyway. You know why? And I just thought of why I wasn't completely satisfied with the movie. I mean, listen, it was not wasted. The acting is tremendous. And it wasn't the Joseph gordon Levitt acting. It was a choice that Frank made, which it was a choice generally I agree with all of his choices. He never met the girlfriend who lost her leg in the accident. He sees her every day passing by the ice rink. He never and goes he, and talks to her. He anymore. never goes and talks to her. And I think that I couldn't forgive Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character because she didn't forgive him in the movie. That, that It's good in that. You're right. That's a choice. And That's a choice. He I mean, probably didn't want it to be sappy and have but but let's not we're giving away too much so let's we're giving away too much but that's but but watch it oh yeah well we're giving away too much but you got to watch it i don't think check it out the other thing before we go though because you did want to mention this too and we do have a minute or so here like get shorty um if you've never seen get shorty uh you gotta you, you just it with danny devito and john travolta and if 
uh, Dennis, um, Dennis Farina, who's Dennis. one of my all time. Oh. He's been, he's one of the, one of these days we're going to talk about midnight run. Cause it's one of my all time greatest oh, films. But now what we have to talk about midnight run. Yeah. And, and Farina's in that DeVito Travolta and Hackman. I mean, Hack, Hackman. Just, yeah. And just the tone, the humor, yeah. uh, the, the, the totally shitting on Hollywood and the uh, script. And, and this, it's just awesome. So get shorty. They, they made it into a, a, a series that I don't, I never nah, saw. They tried to, but I mean, how can you, you know, no. I mean, just so many good lines from that. Like, you know, like, and we do have to do midnight run two words, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's plenty more, but that was a great one. <laughs> De Niro and Groden. Oh, so good. All right, Drew. Uh, I think we're good on Scott Frank. Check him out, folks. Google him, IMDb him, watch his work, read his scripts. And you uh, got movies, TV, movies, streaming, TV. everything in between. You got it here. Yeah, you got it here. Good stuff for Giuliano. I'm Gary Tangway. See you, folks. We'll talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.